See, and then it was on the 16th of December that everything was quiet. You know, we were almost like on a picnic out there because everything was quiet. And then the morning of the 16th, the bombs came down, and then we didn't know what was going on, and the cooks couldn't even light the stoves because of the bombs coming. And then uh, the captain, Captain Rockwell, asked me to go up to the front, up on a hill with him. So we went up there, a couple more of us, and uh, the Germans were down on the road down there, and we had a couple of six by sixes loaded with things for Christmas and a couple of Jeeps. And uh, we, uh, he was calling my shots because all we had was a carbine, which is like a 22, and that's not very good for long distance. So the captain was calling my shots with, with binoculars. So about uh, then the snow was kicked up in my face, and I had to take my glasses off, clean my glasses, and then, then a piece of branch from a tree fell down on my head because it was cut with the German shooting. The, the bullets missed me. They were above me and below me. So anyhow, the thing slowed down about 3 o'clock. So the captain said, well, I'm going to take some guys and go back, get some, see if we get any, anything to eat. So uh, he left me and the guy, Sergeant Fraser, over there, and we were supposed to stay on the hill, but there was nothing going on by the trucks. So he and I, well, let's go look, see what's happening by the trucks. So we go down there and uh, no, no, no dead bodies, no nothing. So we get in a Jeep and we go down the road. And some guy hollered at us, was in a house down there, he hollered. He said, hey, get in off the road. The Germans are on the, uh, over across the street. So we get to leave the Jeep and go into his house. There was a lieutenant in there. And uh, it was a Cape Cod house with bedrooms upstairs. And I went upstairs and they had machine guns at each, all the windows upstairs. And I looked out and says, oh, here comes our tanks. I looked again and it wasn't our tanks. I saw the German helmet. And so this, to this day, I don't know how I got in the basement, but I wound up in the basement. Only six of us, of all the people at that house, got in that basement. See? And so they were shooting at the house for quite a while. And then it uh, starting to get dark and finally things quieted down. And the lady of the house told us to drop our guns. And I had a Thompson 45 sub and hand grenades all around. I was really loaded. So anyhow, he, um, the lady of the house said we'd drop our stuff and come outside. And to this day, I think the only reason the Germans didn't shoot us, that lady stood right next to me. So anyhow, they took us and uh, put us in a uh, woodshed, which is like a corn crib, if you know what a corn crib is, with the slat, one, one by fours with space between, so the corn would dry out. Well, the Germans had that in front of their house for their wood, so the wood would dry out. And it was only about six by six square, and they put six of us in there. And the weather was below zero, and that's where I got my frozen feet. And the next day they took us, and the next, and the next morning, I looked around the dead Germans all the way around, the, as far as you could see almost, and they had put sheets over themselves so you couldn't see them in the snow. That's how come they came in there like that, see? And uh, so then they put us in another, another building in town, which was, the town was AUV, it was a really small town. But anyhow, I remember that uh, our medic came to the door and told a German soldier that he had uh, a wounded German soldier there. Where should we take him? He said, we don't have no medical equipment up here. Take him to your own medics. And then they put us with a group of them. Then they marched us and they marched us. Uh, this was December 6, 17. And all I remember is the uh, Christmas day, the 25th, we were in a camp and there was a dog fight with a P-38 and a German plane up in the air and then of course the American won and then he saw us all there and he tipped his wings which was kind of normal to make an acknowledgement that he saw us and from there we went to uh, I don't remember how even how we got there those old boxcars like they have in a Holocaust, Holocaust Museum in Tampa that they used to call them 40 and 8 40, 40 men and 8 horses except in ours I think there were 80 men in there not even room to uh, sit down you had to stand up and no toilet facilities, and they took us to Camp for, uh, Stalag 4B. And at 4B, the, there were uh, English people in there and French people, soldiers, they, they had been there for five years. And the English people, they were nice, they had a big kettle of tea going. And we had to sleep on the floor, and my feet were so felt so bad 
that I had to put sticks underneath there to keep the blankets off. It hurt so much. So anyhow, from there they registered us and gave me a number, which was 314704. When they gave us a German dog tag, just like we have two dog tags. You know why they have two? One they bury you, one they bury with you, and the next one they, they send to wherever they have to send it to. And we had the same thing with German, you bend it apart. And I have one because I gave the other half to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. So and then uh, uh, so about a week later they put us on a train to Gorlitz, to, uh, Germany, which is right on the Czech border. But it was just about 30 miles from Dresden. And then we were in there till February the 14th, because I remember saying to my buddy, you know, hey, that's a, a happy Valentine's Day. And the reason why, in Dresden, I met some people not, not too long ago that were in Dresden, and when the Russians were coming, the German guards just left, and left them to wherever they could do, you know. But our captain, the German captain, he got us all together, there were 1,600 of us. And we were on a march and every day he would put us in a barn. And later on I found out why our captain did that, was because he had two sons that were prisoners in the United States. And he knew they were being treated good. So he did what he could. Every day he had a, found us something to eat, put us in a barn and made the people that owned a farm, made a big pot of something in the morning. So when we got out of barn, at least we had one bowl of something. And you had to carry your own bowl with you, otherwise they didn't supply nothing. So anyhow, we survived, and then uh, every day we walked, and April, uh, we were in barns and whatever they could find to put us in, but never outside. And you never had to change your clothes, and lice were all over you. Every morning you got up and you took the cuff of your pants, and they got the big lice out. The next morning they were in the big one, they grew again. But anyhow, we got, uh, I escaped the, uh, about the 10th of April. And uh, we went in the woods, and how we escaped was a, was a curve in the road. And uh, while the uh, Germans were up there, the guards, and by the way, all of our guards were not German soldiers. Only about uh, five or six of them were, the rest were people from town that they had taken. And that one, one uh, barns we were in was a, a German civilian that they gave him a gun. And he pulled out a billfold and he showed me his wife his picked his kids and he said, I'm really he spoke good English. He said, I'm really a school teacher. And he started crying. He says he said, Here, hold my gun. And uh, he said, uh, the Russians were terrible. And he said, I don't think I'll ever see my family again. Which was probably true. Because what I hear what I heard about the Russians, of course the Germans treated the Russians like that when they were going into Germany. And he said and the Russians were told the soldier treat them like animals. So anyhow, I escaped and uh, we made our way at nighttime to uh, west. And we had one of our group, the six of us, knew how to read the stars. And that's how we made our way back to the American lines. And this one morning, uh, we were in this woods and I saw the, our trucks going by down on the road. So I went down there and uh, Got the, finally caught the last truck. I had to walk in the farmer's plow in the field and didn't even look back to see me or anything. And I finally got the last truck. And he said, man, he says, I wish I could stay here and take you someplace, but I can't. I got to keep up with my column. So anyhow, I said, but the Americans are in the next town. So why don't you go to the next town backward, you know, back where I came from.